Good afternoon. I'm uh, Pinellas County Sheriff Bob Gualtieri. So I want to start with some background uh, and start by saying this, that there's really nothing more important that government does to ensure public safety and care for the most vulnerable among us, especially our children. It's at the core of what government does and what the government function is, and that is to take care of people, especially the kids. Here in Florida, <clears throat> the Department of Children and Families is generally responsible for child welfare, but in seven of Florida's counties, including here in Pinellas County, it is the sheriff's responsibility under Florida law to investigate allegations of abuse, abandonment, and neglect of children, not the Department of Children and Families. This includes allegations of institutional abuse or neglect, meaning the abuse or neglect occurred at the hands of an entity that's responsible for caring for the child, such as a school, daycare facility, social service agency, etc. The Pinellas County Sheriff's Office has had the statutory responsibility for conducting child welfare investigations here in Pinellas County since 1999, and we respond to about 10,000 allegations a year of child mistreatment or maltreatment. We have about 140 uh, employees in our Child Protection Investigation Division. When we substantiate findings of abuse, abandonment, or neglect, we have to decide whether to leave that child in the home or facility with appropriate services under a safety plan or to remove the child from his or her parent or caregiver. In either case, leaving the child in place with services or removing the child from the home, the provision of services and the placement after removal becomes the responsibility of the community-based care provider lead agency or what is referred to as the CBC. The Florida Department of Children and Families has contracted the CBC lead agency here in Pinellas County to be Eckerd Connects Community Alternatives. In sum, we do the investigation, and when there is abuse or neglect, we turn the case over to Eckerd to provide services, and it is Eckerd's responsibility to case manage the child and family, and if necessary, place the child in foster care. Eckerd services have been substandard and in many cases ineffective, and that has caused a backlash on our child protection investigative efforts. This is something that we have been trying to work through with Eckerd and the Department of Children and Families for some time. But about a week ago, more egregious actions by Eckerd came to our attention. Eckerd's offices are located at 8550 Olmerton Road, which is in the city of Largo. It's just to the east of here at the intersection of Starkey and Olmerton Road. We learned that Eckerd has been having children who re were removed from their homes because of abuse or neglect and who should have been placed in the care of a family member or foster care live at Eckerd's administrative offices. Apparently, from the best information we have right now, Eckerd has about 60 to 70 children who are in a what's called a night-to-night -night status where they don't have housing for them, so they move them to a different place to sleep every night. Some of the kids Eckerd cannot place at all, even in some of these night-to-night -night locations, are housed at their administrative offices, and the best information we have <clears throat> is on average they're housing about six kids a night in those offices. The children sleep on cots, or some cases they sleep under the desks. They sleep in dirty clothes, they don't have toiletries or towels, and they don't have access to hot meals while they're sleeping in those administrative offices. The Largo Police Department has responded about 30 times to Eckerd's offices over the last month, at all hours of the day and night, because the children sleeping and living are disruptive, causing problems with the staff, and running away from the offices. The conditions in which these children have been living at Eckerd's offices, frankly, is disgusting and deplorable. The conditions are as bad or worse than the living conditions from which the children were removed when we investigated the conditions at the children's homes. Children have received physical injuries while living at Eckerd offices. One child took unprescribed medication and another child overdosed on unsecured drugs and had to be transported to the hospital by EMS. More specifically, last Thursday, 
Three teens living at the Eckerd office, unbeknown to the staff member, left the office, and this was in the nighttime hours, and went to the rear of the building and climbed on a ladder to get to the roof. One child fell and lacerated his stomach on a piece of metal sticking out of the ladder. The children flagged down a police officer who was in the area, and the injured child had to be transported to the hospital by ambulance. Last Friday, children who Eckerd had living at their offices had their medication being stored unsecured in a conference room. One of the kids living there got access to the medication that was not his, and another overdosed on his own medication because it was unsecure, and he too had to be transported to the hospital by ambulance. These night-to-night -night placements have also led to Eckerd placing children in unlicensed facilities for the night. In one situation, a child was being transported by an employee of one of these unlicensed facilities. And the kid was in a car, and there was an unsecured gun in the car that the kid got access to. In another situation, one of the employees of these unlicensed facilities has pending current charges for conspiracy to distribute hydrocodone and racketeering. So yeah, they put a drug trafficker in charge of vulnerable kids. Based upon all of what we have recently uncovered about the conditions at Eckerd's administrative offices and their treatment of children and their care, I believe the situation created by Eckerd constitutes child abuse and neglect, and as such, the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office is commencing a criminal investigation of Eckerd Connects Community Alternatives and its senior management. A corporate entity can be charged with a crime, and Eckerd as an entity and senior management individually are the subjects of our investigation regarding child abuse and neglect. But the scope of this investigation may expand as we move forward in the investigative process. One of the things I want to be clear about is our investigation is not about the line workers, not about those line people uh, who were making a few bucks an hour, who were doing what they could with the resources that they had, or in many cases did not have, as provided by their employer. So think about this situ situation for a minute. We have children who are sadly abused and neglected by their parents. We remove the children because the environment that they're living in is so bad that it's too dangerous to leave them in their own homes with their moms and their dads or their caregivers. We turn these kids over to the organization that receives tens of millions of dollars in state money and it's supposed to be a safe place. The people who will care for them when their parents did not and ensure their safety, and that organization houses them in deplorable, dirty conditions, allows them to take drugs they should not take, injure themselves to the extent that they have to be transported to the hospital by ambulance, and exposes them to spending the night at a location run by a drug dealer under criminal charges, current criminal charges for racketeering. All this and more by the entity that is duty-bound to protect children and keep them safe. In announcing that we've started a criminal investigation into Eckerd for child abuse and neglect, including institutional abuse under Florida Statute 39.302, we're not going to be releasing any more specific details because this is now an ongoing criminal matter. We've assigned experienced detectives to conduct the investigation. I don't have a timetable on how long the investigation will take, but I assure the public that we will conduct the investigation thoroughly and diligently. I've been in communication over the last several days with Department of Children and Family Secretary Siobhan Harris, and we will continue to help and fully support DCF in its ongoing effort to ensure the safety of our vulnerable children here in Pinellas County while DCF transitions to a new CBC or community-based care provider. So that's the situation. Uh, happy to answer any questions that I can uh, that you may have. So what's happening right now with the Six kids, you know, on average, you say per night are having to stay in those offices. Is, that, is this continuing as we, as we speak? You know, trying to do away with it. DCF is working hard. I can tell you the Secretary Harris has deployed a number of people from DCF out of Tallahassee here to Pinellas County. Uh, DCF has taken an active role. Uh, they're overseeing things, and we're working hard with them to make sure that the kids are safe. A little bit more on, on who this criminal investigation target is. It, is it the board? Is it the administration? Who is it? Well, really, it, it, again, it's the entity itself is, is who we're looking at, an, an entity which includes the, the corporate entity of Eckerd. 
Uh, but again, it, it, the senior management as well, and I'm not going to name names at this point, uh, but suffice it to say it's senior management and people who were uh, engaged in certain acts or not engaged in certain responsibilities that they had, and again, abuse or neglect. Um, so there, it'll be pretty far reaching, uh, the investigation, and we're going to again conduct it fairly, uh, but diligently and hold people accountable where they need to be held accountable. And I give you some of the things here because I think it's important that people know that this is bad and the extent to which this has been going on. And it really just came to light and came to our attention the magnitude of this uh, within the last week. Um, and within the last, when the state terminated their contract, I think earlier in the week, I, I interviewed the chair of the board and he said, you know, he admitted that they had a lot of problems. Um, but he also said he, he blamed it on money, a lack of money from the state. Do you buy that? Did he ever go there and look at these deplorable conditions that I've seen? Did he know about them housing kids with an organization with somebody under active criminal charges for racketeering and trafficking in hydrocodone? Know about kids having access to guns? Know about kids having their guts split open? Know about kids overdosing on drugs? That isn't about money. That's about just failing. That's not about doing the right thing. Look, we have a contract with the state to conduct these investigations, to conduct child welfare investigations. We have money challenges. No doubt we have money challenges. And we got to work hard to make it work. But you don't whine about it. You fix it. And if you can't do it, you go to the state and you say, hey, look, this isn't working and here's why. You call Secretary Harris. You call people in the legislature, you do what you have to do, but you still do your job and you don't expose kids to danger while you're trying to fix it. You figure out a way to make it happen. I don't know whether they have money problems or not. We all got money problems, but we make it happen. And you don't do these things that I'm talking about. And th there's more than this. I'm just giving you a flavor of it. The chair also said to us yesterday that a lot of these kids are allowed to refuse services. Do you know if any of the six or those children did that for a few services? No, I mean, they're, they're sleeping in the offices in dirty clothes with no hot meals, shower facilities that nobody should get into. They're filthy. In these conditions is that what services are they refusing? I mean, they may, there may be sometimes, that's not what we're talking about here. I mean, they may be refusing some types of services, uh, whether it be, I don't know, mental health services. I'm not sure what he's talking about. But these are kids that have been removed because the situation they were in at their homes was so bad that we felt that we couldn't leave them there under a safety plan and with any type of in-home services. So we got to put them at a place where they're safe. And they went to a place that is as bad or worse than the place we took them from. I mean, that's the crux of it. And, and the rest of it is all excuses at this point as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you don't let this happen. You don't allow these, condition, these conditions to exist. And, and nobody ever said that these kids were not challenges. But look at what the conditions they're coming from. Look at the situation, look at their lives. You're talking about a lot of these kids are you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, younger, some older but they're vulnerable and, and they need help. And, and we, as a community, we as a society have an obligation to them and they've been failed. Sheriff Love Price, you don't comment on active investigations. Uh, this one's just starting. Why was it important to announce that this investigation was taking place now? Because people need to know what's going on out there uh, because it is important to the community and also important that the community know that we're on it and we're looking at it and we're going to do everything that we can possibly do to ensure the safety of the kids in Pinellas County. So I think it's important. This is one of those things where uh, information was put out there. Uh, it needs to be put out there as much as we can uh, in its totality so people understand the seriousness of it, uh, the gravity, and, but that we're on it. And we're working closely with DCF and we're going to do all we can uh, to get this right. Are you able to describe um, what some of these unlicensed facilities were aside from the office? Was it like a hotel or 
And I'm not going to get into most of them were organizations. So it isn't like they're just sticking them in. No, they're organizations, but they're unlicensed. So which means the people aren't going through background checks, which means they're not vetted, which means you have somebody that's got an active criminal charges for uh, drug trafficking and racketeering that are put in charge of kids. It means you got people that are driving kids around, they got guns in their cars, and you got a 14 year old that gets access to a gun. I mean, that, those are the things that happen uh, in these, you know, unlicensed, but there are organizations primarily. Sheriff, um, the DCF put Eckerd on a corrective plan back in May, and, and at that time they knew that these kids were night to night and, and sleeping in unlicensed, unapproved placements. Um, wh why isn't DCF subject to the investigation? Well, in and of its, well, first, you got to ask DCF what it knew or didn't know. I can't comment on that, okay? Is, is that DCF, okay, is th there is, you can have on a limited basis, you can have kids that are in uh, unlicensed day to day, but not under these conditions. You still have an obligation to make sure that they don't have access to guns and that they don't have uh, drug dealers and racketeers that are supervising them. So. Again, that is supposed to be a very limited, temporary circumstance or situation, not that something is done ongoing. DCF doesn't have skin in this. It is is that Eckert has skin in this. The people who were not managing properly, who weren't going into the offices, they didn't know what in the world was going on there, and again, taking all of this state money, uh, tens of millions of dollars, and letting kids overdose in their offices, letting kids fall off the roof. That's not DCF, that's Eckert. Chef, do you wish you would start this investigation a little sooner? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Do you wish you would start this investigation a little sooner? Some of these oh. allegations have been out there now for, for a couple of years. I, I wish we knew about it to this extent uh, sooner so that we could have started the investigation sooner and prevented some of these kids from going through what they've gone through. Yeah. You know, but again, this is that as soon as we found out about the magnitude of this, the extent of it, the nature of it, which was just in the last week, is, is that we moved pretty fast on this once we became aware of the magnitude of it. What's the avenue, maybe somebody who, like you were saying, these line workers, these folks who were in it trying to just do the best work they could with what they had, what's their avenue of being able to report something like this to you? Well, they can. Anybody can report. I mean, there are mechanisms through the hotline and through other ways that they can report. But, you know, these people are employees of that organization and, you know, probably trying to hold on to their jobs because that's all they had. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's I, those people are in a tough situation. They're in a tough spot. I mean, they're, they're as much, quote, victims as anybody else. So, uh, you know, I want to say and make clear again, since you raise it, that this is not about those line workers. This isn't about those employees. Those are people that are just trying to do their job. And they are in a very, very tough situation. Um, I, again, I, this, that's not the focus of what we're going to look at. The, the people in the, the higher up positions, the organization itself, the ones that made these decisions, either did things or didn't do things, um, those are the ones that need to be held accountable. Would you well, want to comment on the, the Inspector General's report that said and showed that some of the executives at the top were overpaid? Is that, and is that part of this investigation? Not part of this investigation. We don't have any jurisdiction over that. That's, that's something for the DCFIG uh, to look at. Everybody knows what's going on with that. You know, of course, I'm aware of it, but it has nothing to do with us. And I know you mentioned six specific cases, but how many kids overall would you say you believe Eckerd could have failed or put in danger? Tons, lots. I mean, there's, again, I want to be clear with this, there's an average on any given night of about six kids that are being housed in their offices. But that, those kids move around that varies. So it's not just six cases. There's, there's a number of kids that have been housed there uh, in those, what I'll just characterize as deplorable conditions, because they are, um, uh, for an ongoing basis for uh, a long time. And so you know, we'll figure out exactly how many uh, victims there are. And then you've got the kids that are in this night to night status and the other circumstances that they've been exposed to. So I think, again, and one of the reasons why I explain this the way it is, because the, the magnitude of this is pretty broad. Uh, and I think the scope of it is pretty broad. And we're probably at the tip of it. And that's why we're going to conduct an investigation and see what's there. Uh, I believe there's enough uh, to certainly commence the investigation in a criminal investigation. We'll let the facts and the evidence take us down the path. We'll see where it goes. So when we're talking about more than obviously just six kids, I know you mentioned 60 to 70 this mm -hmm. night tonight. 
you know, what happens to them now? I mean, right now when this investigation is going on, how do we know they're safe? Well, I mean, that's hard. I can tell you. So, so as an example, I'll give you an example because how do you know they're safe is, is that uh, the Department of Children and Families is here. They're making a significant effort to ensure that the kids are safe. They brought staff in. They're doing checks. We helped them yesterday. They had some questions yesterday. DCF was here. They had some questions uh, about 93 kids right, that they had some questions about. They were in the three-year range, three-year-old range, about whether those kids had, were safe, about whether those kids um, had received the right services. And there were a lot of questions about that. So yesterday we took 30 detectives and they went out and put eyes on all 93 of those kids just to verify, to make sure. So those are the kinds of things that are going on uh, to make sure uh, that nothing's falling through the cracks or, and to do the best we can until they transition us to a new CBC that will hopefully come in and get this right. I'm not sure if it's possible or not, but maybe some of these kids have aged out of the you know, foster care or whatever, but may have been in that situation at some point. Are you hoping that they come forward and tell you, hey, I was one of these kids? Sure, absolutely. Anybody that wants to come forward would be more than happy to take the information. We're going to be, again, reaching out, doing interviews, doing what we do in the investigative process. Anybody that, that has information uh, that would be relevant to this, we uh, encourage them to come forward and provide it to us. And I know DCF is looking for a new agency to take over. Do we know how soon that could happen? Well, they put Eckerd on notice that the contract expires December 31st, so it, it, within the next 60 days. Um, and that, again, I, I would probably direct more of those questions to the department on that as to what their plan is and whether they'll actually be able to get somebody in or what they'll do in the interim, et cetera. But you know, I have a lot of confidence in Secretary Harris. I can tell you that she's been very responsive to this. She's stepping up, doing the right thing, and is very committed, very committed to getting this right. All right, thanks, everybody.